All right, you glorious, you miserable, accursed. We've made it. Final pod of the year. The last time in 2023 you'll have to listen to the four of us in a political ruckus. Because we're taking a wee break next week. We'll be back January the 8th. But to tide you over for the next 14 or so days, we're going to be at full fucking ruckus today. It's our year in review, candy cane or coal debate here on The Curse of Politics, wherein David, Scott, Jordan and Corey pick, oh, about 10 or 11 topics, best political strategy, worst political strategy, premier of the year, and more, and debate the shit out of each other. Handing out peppermint plaudits are nasty chunks of carbonic rock, plus our final hey use for 2023 with the brilliant Mr. Pinsent. Jordan, Corey, Scott, you ready for Christmas? I'm, I'm yep. as ready as a millennial. Your little tree behind be. you, Jordan. I do. Nice to see. I stole this from my six-year-old's room. It's very festive. I've got my shacket. I'm like ready for the holidays. Um, but yes, it's a uh, uh, you know, if you have parents of young children in your life right now, extend them grace because they are tra- they are just trying to get to the finish line uh, with with presents and and like cookie exchanges and and fucking theme days from school and all of that so um, yeah I, yeah you want to hear something I do that's yeah. nothing that's here's, nothing to, here's what's what going on got. in my ten year old school okay? okay they have for the Christmas season invoked a parent choir where the parents are to come. And sing. So this tonight, is the worst idea oh, that's so I've much ever worse. Heard. That's so, so much worse. So tonight for ninety minutes, I have Wait. to go and practice choir. Then on Wednesday, I'm part of a two hour show. In this could be four. ingenious fundraising though. Like, pay me money and I don't have to do this. Pay me money and I don't have to it's, hear it. I that, and I, that's the I gotta go. My ten year old is absolutely obsessed with the idea of seeing me humiliated and present on stage. In grade four, this is not a lie. This is the God's honest truth. There were two children in grade four who were not permitted to participate in the Massasauga public school choir. Me and the kid who was Jehovah's Witness. He couldn't because of religious objection. I was asked to leave just because the sounds that came from me were so grating. (laughs) You're not supposed to be farting. Well, uh, I tried to hum with my mouth open. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be praying for you, Scott. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, Should be bonus mm-hmm. video. It's no good. Corey, I'm wearing my Beach Boys shirt because I'm going to Saskatchewan on Friday and it is apparently balmy. Oh, yeah. Well, I just got back from Calgary like late last night and, and a, a couple important things and by way of information to impart for you. I found a burger place in Calgary. That on top of, of their fries, they put, you know, chili and then cheese. It's great. But here's the clincher. They pound up Hawkins cheesies and then they dust oh. the. I like th- this was this wow. was. Wow. Have some. Hi. David Hurley. Uh, so anyway, I'm going to send you all the deets next time you're in You Calgary. got to. You got to. That That's would make me science. go to Calgary. So yeah. wrong. It's right. Yeah. They don't hard rum at the at the bar uh there as well it would have been you know like i would have thought you'd own the restaurant but it was it was it was pretty damn good we were there we were there friends um you know getting into the to the christmas spirit uh you, we should have actually brought the, the crew to uh the uh, queen's park christmas party that i went to though because you would have seen me doing karaoke uh with travis con we sang uh, shallow uh from uh, the stars born uh, uh soundtrack really did you did you did you have the I, Gaga part? I was doing Cooper, Bradley. Look at the hair. <laughs> uh, Did you urinate on yourself? <laughs> uh, I'm not sure there's enough alcohol in the world for oh, this one. Oh, my God. Next, <laughs> we're going to be talking about rolling pins. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> Careful. <laughs> that just... <laughs> Settle down. Oh, there's that line. Settle down. <laughs> All right, so this is the way this thing is going to work, folks. We have a category. I'm going to put out a default answer, and we can talk about that, or you can take issue with the default answer and suggest another one of your own. All right? Are we starting from the okay. top? Like We're starting at the top. All right. Starting at the top. The biggest story or event of the year in Canadian politics is, and our default answer is, the Conservative Party, the CPC, taking and holding a double-digit lead over the Liberals is the biggest event in the year in politics. Corey, do you agree? Yeah, I think it is. Um, it's 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 what's changed, and it's what's also the most impactful. 
So, you know, I think it's a big story sort of everywhere. So, yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, agree. Uh, and I, I think, it, you know, the, the trajectory changed too. I think like coming out of the spring, I think uh, things were not looking as good for the conservatives in the spring when, when everything was about the uh, foreign interference storyline, et cetera. And I, I think they really got their mojo back by, by bringing the focus back to affordability, back towards those sort of common bread and butter issues that uh, that are, are animating the electorate right now. Yeah, I mean, it sort of all happened last summer, right? And it seemed to be a combination of bad economy, high interest rates, Polyev branding campaign uh, on television, and I don't know, something just breaking about the government around that time, something breaking in public attitudes about the, around the government about that time. But it's definitely two different years. The part of the 2023 where it was a deadlock and people were making predictions based on that and talking about Trudeau's future based on that. And then all of a sudden in the last four or five months, we've had a very, very different scenario, eh, Jordan? Yeah, I would agree. And actually, I was thinking about exactly that trajectory as we were kind of discussing the show today is that, you know, if we'd been having this conversation in the spring, I think we all would have been fairly astonished at where things sit at the end of the year, given what the spring was like in terms of, let's say, some relative aimlessness around where the Conservatives were focusing. But I think the third thing that happened in the summer that really turned the tide was you really saw, like, a failed reset on the part of the Liberals. Like they took, they took that opportunity of the cabinet shuffle. And I think we can even extend it really into the cabinet retreat. And they tried to hit that reset button and it just, it not only did it fail, but I think it actually reinforced some of their biggest communications weaknesses. They elected not to make any change to Freeland and the finance minister there was no real reset in the prime minister's messaging. So you had them on one hand coming out saying, ah, like we've heard, we're going to refresh, we're going to do much better. And really, like, I think the only positive thing that came out of that for them was, was Fraser and housing, which I, I'm sure we'll talk more about. But that I think was that third piece, like that they really, <clears throat> they tried and they failed that reset. And that combined with Tiff Macklin just making Trudeau's life miserable and $3 million poured into an exercise to positively brand Polyev critically in the absence of any liberal efforts to define the shit out of this guy. I think that was like the perfect storm that really turned things and turned it in a really enduring way as it turns out. Yeah, but Scott, it was like, it happened this summer, but it had been building, right? Like it didn't really happen this summer. It's something that had been building up like it felt to me in the spring, if I've been describing the liberals, like they were the cartoon character that runs off the cliff, but doesn't fall until they realize they've run off the cliff. So they're running in air for a period yeah. of time, but you know they're going to fall when you're watching them. That's why for for me, I, I agree. Um, but I think either a related or uh, underlying factor in terms of biggest story were interest rates. I think that... Yeah. I, I think that interest rates redefined the economic environment, the personal finances environment for Canadians. And that is when people looked over and saw that the Liberals were running on air, right? And and when the cabinet retreat was not an event that addressed that, when the prime minister and the finance minister took so long to seem to recognize the mood shift and couldn't get... Um, couldn't find the balance between trying to say, listen, we've got the right plan and we recognize the hardship that you're feeling. And they just couldn't get that sequence and that tone and that emphasis, right? So to me, like the interest rates were the thing combined with, and you look at the Atlantic Canada, the application of the carbon tax coming in on July 1st. I just think all of that created a situation where people sort of said, wait a goddamn second, what's the government to do? And I know, and Jordan hates me for this, and for many, many reasons, really, <laughs> Merry Christmas. Cheese. Uh, Why that, cheese, um, Scott? Um, you know, I, I don't even quarrel with the Bank of Canada. Like, I think it had to do what it, it it's done. And arguably, if we're seeing, say, two interest rate cuts by, by the summer, I think people will look back on this and go, well, that was a, an improbably successful effort to navigate a a soft landing. But the political consequences of raising interest rates are inescapable. Uh, good, bad, indifferent, they just hammer governments. And when governments compound it by not having any kind of 
narrative reaction to it that's you know in sync with people's feelings and experiences and it is just bad right so this is the event of the year not just because the liberals are down 10 or more points to the conservatives but because that fact changes so many other things it changes the way the media cover the government it changes the way everybody perceives what the government does uh, it puts everything they do into the context of, oh, they're desperate. So they're doing something desperate now. You get less of a look at your policy choices, and they're all viewed more cynically and politically. Um, a lot of things change when you get into a situation like this. Can I pick up on that yeah, just quickly? Because I, I, as a comms director, former comms director, Corey also, um, that, that the way that, as you say, suddenly everything goes through the looking glass of, Oh, well, they're just trying to correct anything. They're desperate. They're like it. And, and then it, it fucks up your internal clocks, right? And, and, and compasses really. So suddenly caucus starts putting tons of pressure on, not just in terms of bitching and moaning, oh, should Trudeau go and all that stuff, but they start saying, no, we're not getting our story out there. Like we got, and their instincts are always to run exactly in the wrong direction. Let's start telling people about all our economic successes and like, let's, why aren't we out there talking about, you know, all the, the jobs we're, we're creating and the, and, and, and it's not, you know, why aren't we doing binomics? Why aren't we doing, it's not as bad as it feels right and so um it really Going does for alter <laughs> everything well panic is contagious right and i think it just sweeps through like wildfire in that situation Except then you sit around and go, well, I'm not panicking. And there's nothing worse than somebody who's going, I'm not panicking. I mean, like, what do I care? I'm in a kitchen as the house burns down. I'm fine. This is cool. I'm yeah. in the kitchen. I'm happy. It's supposed to be hot here. No. Well, ca caucus, always, caucus always moves around like a school of fish, you know, darting to and fro, you know, en masse uh, without any, you know, seeming sense other than, you know, respond to, to the most basic stimuli out there. So, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't think they've done themselves any favors in, in the response. But I think like touching on the interest rate stuff, there's like a fundamental problem that, I, you know, as you say, every government has. The Bank of Canada is not really in the communications business. And uh, and they've really chosen not to, you know, explain the why at all. And I think, you know, Freeland is, is a pretty incompetent communications person from everything that we've seen. And they're not doing it either. So you've got only one economic narrative that's really out there being sold. And, and it's Polyos. And, and uh, you know, not surprisingly, it works better for him than it does for anyone else. Yeah, I would agree with that. I also think that that's a bit particular to Tiff Macklin, right? We've had previous Bank of Canada governors who have been more adept at communicating some of the real life aspects of their work. And Macklin just seems uninterested in that. Well, I actually think they've done a little bit in that area more than others. Yeah. But you're kind of suggesting that they need to get into the paid communications business. Because if you actually look at social media, they are now publishing the texts of their convert of their discussions about interest rates and Macklem is out there and other people are out there giving speeches trying to explain it, but who reads that? Who hears that? Yeah, I don't think it's penetrating. It's uh, pissing into the wind. I actually think it's admirable in a lot of ways. They're they're sh shifting the culture of the bank in terms of what they're willing to talk about and when and the specificity of it. It's very dramatically different than years past, but um, it's in the worst environment to try to actually have a, a message uh, penetrate that we've ever seen. So. You know, well, right as Elon, it's not even good for social media, just as Elon Musk breaks Twitter and turns it into a toilet bowl for the Alex Joneses of the world. It's like, great. Okay. Uh, there's nowhere to go to get people to hear you. So non-event of the year, the big story or event of the year that didn't matter. Our default answer, Jordan, is foreign political interference, specifically Chinese political interference in Canadian elections. We spent Hard a lot agree. of time on this show talking about this subject. There was a lot of media ink spilled on this, a lot of time in the House of Commons spent on this. And if you ask people what the number one issue was in Canada right now, not one person would say that. So what happened? Well, I think, yeah, and it's funny. I was also trying to think, like, were we right about this or wrong about it? But I think we were all fairly consistent in saying that this was not going to be a story that actually bore a lot of political fruit. So right. anyways, I'm sure our listeners will go back and fact check us. But <laughs> the I think what happened here is a few things. Is First, uh, it, was, it became a process story. The issue around the inquiry and Johnson and... All of this, like it, it got so deeply into the weeds that 
it actually moved very quickly off the genuinely shocking initial allegations and and into process, which is uh, the place where interest just dies, right? So I think I I don't I don't think that was intentional on the part of the government. They couldn't. I don't think they could orchestrate their way into such a clever thing, particularly in the spring. I think it just happened, probably aided and abetted by some really bad conservative strategy in the spring, where they also heavily went after process. Um, and that drove the story there. And I think that was a big part of it just uh, sort of fizzling away. And then, you know, and also like the leaking stopped, right? Which is another thing that's really interesting and we didn't really talk about. But right. this was driven initially. She killed somebody. Well, you yeah. know, I, <laughs> to overestimate what our, what our intelligence services are capable of, David. <laughs> sure what happened but the leaking <laughs> has stopped for the moment and so without a steady stream of new intel to kind of feed the story that also dropped off interest and then you know lastly i think that it was just very hard to sustain public interest in the story that had nothing to do with people's day-to-day -day lived experience of the cost of living crisis which was really front you know top of mind for most uh most regular folks so i think it was a combination of factors that made it a bit of a non-issue um but as others said earlier i really do think like the conservatives chasing the story so hard in the spring was was probably a strategic mistake on their part as well so I'm recording this piece in the last week leading up to Christmas. Kwanzaa is just days away. Hanukkah lit its eighth and final candle end of last week. For a good portion of the world, this is giving season. So I wanted to finish up these stories from our presenting sponsor, Tell Us, with a flourish. This, I think, is the best of them. The position of most giving company in the world sounds rather grand, eh? Tell Us, for their part, doesn't look at it as a title to be won. Rather, for the company and its people, it's a commitment, and an unbreakable one at that, best expressed by their signature global volunteer movement, TELUS Days of Giving. TELUS Days of Giving has been running every May for the last 18 years. The event inspires all team members, retirees, family, friends, and customers across the globe to join with the company in giving their time, dollars, and skills. This past May was the most giving year on record. 32 countries around the world, more than 80,000 team members, extended family and friends volunteering and giving back to 260 local communities. Since the inception of Days of Giving, the tally, yep, you bet they keep track of the good works of their people, is over half a million volunteers engaged and enabled to give back. Tallied even further, since the turn of the millennium, the extended TELUS family has provided $1.6 billion in cash, in-kind contributions, time, and programs, including 2.2 million days of volunteering. That's an unparalleled legacy of giving, Hurley Burleyites. And the core of it is this, people connecting with other people to help, to do some good in any way they can. And so I'll end on this heartfelt wish from TELUS to their people, customers, team members, and any loved ones who may be listening. May your days be merry and bright. May the new year bring you happiness and success. Thank you for your giving spirit and for being part of the TELUS family. Happy holidays to you all. Scott, it's, it's such a good example of how so much in politics is actually irrelevant and bullshit. Do you remember the white hot demand for a public inquiry into this, right? And how important it was to have the right person in charge of the inquiry, all this kind of stuff. Is there going to be one? Like what's going to happen? Like, you know, I don't even know what's happening on this file anymore. Like it's, uh, it, it just disappeared, right? And at the moment you could have thought it was the biggest thing in the world. Yeah, I think there were mistakes on both sides on this issue, though. I mean, because even though all of that is true, the government still mangled this in terms of its issues management, in terms of the way that it approached it, the mistakes that it made in terms of assessing the environment. Um, so I, you know, just because something doesn't kill you doesn't mean that you've handled it correctly. Uh, and I do think that the conservatives made a big mistake in terms of the, uh, the volume and focus they get, got it. One other thing I'd say is as smug as we are, because we're, you know, always looking in the rearview mirror at stuff, 
like on the one hand, you look at this and you go, well, this is a potent reminder that um, that there are sometimes issues where you can, as an opposition, dedicate all your energy towards saying like, see, this is the government's fault. And people go, no, I think this is like a bigger global thing. I don't know what all is involved, but I'm not prepared to just lay this at the government's feet. But then sometimes, right, uh, that doesn't work. And sometimes people will blame the government. So like if you look at inflation and so, which you can make a very persuasive argument that really like, I mean, you know, he talks about Justin Trudeau's inflation, just inflation, all that stuff, right? Well, that's all a crock of shit. I mean, this is a global phenomenon, blah, 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 blah. And yet that, you know, the government is being held to account. The last thing I would say, Jordan talked about this earlier. I, I'm myself in a quandary as to, I think this is such a non-event that I wonder whether it qualifies as the best non-event. I think that maybe the best non-event was something that uh, Jordan talked about earlier, which was the cabinet shuffle, because it was supposed to be consequential. This is the biggest shuffle in history, in the history of the Trudeau era. We're going to, you know, and it was volume, uh, not quantity and not quality. And so quantity, not quality. And they exchanged it was just a, people that nobody knew for other people that nobody knew. It was, a it was an astonishingly, like it was an empty calories event. Um, lots of movement, lots of change, none of it connecting with people, none of it altering what the government does, none of it even altering what the government says it does. Yeah, I think and that's I just thought thing. it was it was an astonishingly um for knowing how much energy and personal energy goes into these things, like personal meaning like the the damage it causes internally, um, it was, you know, it was an astonishing wet firecracker. Hmm. Corey, you got anything to add to that? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll maybe tweak the rules a little bit. Like I, the biggest non-event and the thing that didn't happen is a liberal advertising campaign on Polyev. And like I, I think for things that are consequential that did not occur, like and and I'll go further. Like there's no there's no consistent attack narrative there. They're not even really putting out anything more than a thimble full of of content uh, in that vein. But on the other side, you've got the conservatives with the you know, multi-million dollar ad tech campaigns. And, you know, if you're going to not contest a political fight, you're going to lose it. And, and I, it just feels like it's they've, you know, they've left the field this year uh, in terms of, of that aspect of political campaigning. Uh, I think it was a huge strategic error on their part. And, you know, it's, so it's, it's a non-event because uh, they didn't engage in it. And I think it was, you know, probably second only to... Uh, uh, to the rise in conservative polls is probably the biggest thing that occurred by not occurring. I try not to pay too much attention to feedback from the pod because most of it is like, why don't you sit on something sharp, Reed? But the one thing I think we can say with certainty is that our collective condemnation of the Liberals' failure to place a massive ad buy against Polyev has broken through. Uh, people get that that's our take. <laughs> there are so few things that bring us together, Scott. This yeah. is something we can all <laughs> agree on. I mean, I wonder yep. if they. I wonder if they just haven't found the message. Yeah, you know, and you have to get the message right. I mean, to go back to the conversation we were just having about foreign interference, if you're going to accuse Justin Trudeau of not being a good economic manager, of not caring enough about the economy, of letting inflation get out of control, that's believable, and that's an attack that will stick and resonate. If you want to say Justin Trudeau is in bed with the Chinese government and trying to subvert Canadian election campaigns. That's not a believable attack, and that won't stick to him. Well, right? it's, so you have it's to pick the, you have to find the right thing to say. It's not I mean, believable, but you also have the conservatives themselves saying that look, it didn't really change the results of the election. So you know, what, there's this big fight with without us. Like there's a so what that's left kind of unanswered. It's you know, it's oh well, he picked the wrong person to you know lead the inquiry, and he's you know not very competent and. Yeah, sure. But like those are, are not deeply impactful messages compared to, you know, some of the other things that you could be saying. And so I think that, you know, part of the problem is nobody thinks it changed the outcome of the campaign. So yeah. And David, you know, to your point, I think it's true. Like you do need a good message that is believable. But I would also maybe make the argument that at this point, any concerted attack would be better than the nothing that has happened. Like the time that I mean, has I been that you. yeah that has elapsed now without any effort to define policy you cannot get that back so even a, a less than maximally effective attack would be better than nothing at all you like you have to weaken him and that hasn't happened well right. also in order to find if your argument david is well maybe they haven't happened upon the, the potent apple that will poison the conservative support 
Well, like if you're going to look for that hidden come back for you bullseye, if you're going to find it, you got to look for it. And I I mean, I, I, the consistent feedback I get, and maybe this is face saving, but the consistent feedback I get is that this diagnosis is incorrect, that there, that is a strategic choice to not go with a heavy paid media campaign, but there will be one. It'll be closer to the election when people are more properly forming their opinions. Um, and it's like, all right, but hey, I get, it's a hell of a, it's a hell of a gamble. If you're going to lay on the ropes and let George Foreman uh, punch you, you better hope I think it's, it's fundamentally misunderstands really how out. voters form perceptions of leaders now. Right. Well, the line between there's, elections matters. There's a first mover advantage in communications yeah. always. It just is, you know. People, it's called framing. Be, yeah, yeah, it's framing. Exactly. <laughs> like, well, sure. No, seriously, uh, that's the, the theory. Well, sure, but you know, this is this is beyond framing. I think this is about perceptions of, of leaders and individuals. And once you form an opinion about somebody, it takes a lot more work to change that opinion. You know, like there is a first mover advantage in terms of laying down what that looks like, and you know, there's the framing on the on the issue set, but. Uh, but the framing of the actual leader is, I, I think, uh, a little more intimate, a little more personal, and, and frankly, in a more presidentialized system, which we have, more important. All right, let's move on to some of the other picks. Maybe they'll be more controversial. Most outstanding liberal of the year. Our default answer is Sean Fraser, the Minister of Housing. Scott, is that your take? Yeah, indisputably. Um, and and I won't elevate it to this level. I won't elevate it to say that Sean Fraser has changed the way in which people look at the housing problem, that he's changed public attitudes or that he's um, rejuvenated the liberals' reputation on it. I, I don't know that we can make that conclusion. I don't know that that case has been proven. But I know that he's corrected this problem. And this problem was that prior to Sean's arrival in the housing ministry, there was virtually no acknowledgement of the problem, no effort to articulate um, the concerns that Canadians feel, and zero hustle in terms of trying to demonstrate action to correct it. And even if his actions, not all of them hit the bullseye, even if some of them take a long time, as everything does in this kind of area, uh, to bear fruit, He's at least brought a dynamism, an ability to communicate at a at a truck stop level that the government consistently lacks, um, and just like just energy, man, just like getting up every day and fucking pounding on the door, and we just don't see that from these guys. So he's, I, I don't even know who my second choice would be to be honest. But I mean, Seamus, I guess Seamus is also, to be fair, he's sort of doing that on a day by day basis on the labor issues, but it's it's few and far between. Donald Law, uh, he might. Yeah, if you were to put another person there, and it's it's more behind the scenes role, but uh, that's right. It's less visible. It's you know, the, the one thing the you didn't mention about Fraser Scott is for liberals who want to defend the government, he's given them some talking points. Yes, they were helpless. They were defenseless. They were hiding in caves when the housing issue came up, and now they've got something to argue about. But like yep. paradoxically, the fact that he has been so effective at rolling out in the space of like, we're really not talking very much time, right? September, October, November, like four months, right? That, that in that time, he's been so effective at rolling out a fresh narrative with actual messaging for the government on the housing issue also puts into a glaring spotlight how absent that is from almost every other government file. And, and so I agree. I, there, to me, there's no contest that, that Fraser uh, takes the cake for the liberals, but it's also astonishing the distance between him and, you know, with the exception of Le Bon, And I, I think you're right there, you know, maybe one or two others, but the distance between them and the, and the rest of their colleagues and the prime minister is astounding. And there has to be some effort to close that gap because you cannot, you simply cannot continue with your main communicator lacking any kind of messaging or narrative structure that's fresh and has energy behind it. Like the fact that Fraser's out there far outpacing all of his cabinet colleagues and the prime minister is a major fucking problem. Which kind of takes us to our next category, which is least valuable liberal. Wait, we forgot something about Fraser. What's that? He's, re he's really, really tall. 
And as a, dude who's, as, a as, as a dude who's 5'10", I just tell you, I think tall people have a massive advantage. I've, I've always known that, Scott. This is a proven advantage in politics. <laughs> uh, okay, so our next category is least valuable liberal of the year. And our default answer, Corey, is Christia Freeland. Do you agree? Yeah, clearly. Because it's, uh, it's the most important job after the prime minister, I think. In, in the government right now, uh, you know, we're dealing with a, a difficult economy and, and problems around an economic narrative. And so you gotta, you gotta lay the blame for the person responsible for laying out that economic narrative, and, and that's her. And I just think she's been completely ham-fisted, you know, in small ways and in big ways. Small ways like, you know, media missteps, like uh, the, the Disney Plus uh, subscription stuff, but but in bigger ways, just a just a general lack of competency around being able to show some empathy for where people are at in a way that you know people can can understand, to the never ending stream of of gesticulation and bizarro vocal tics that she she mixes in with her presentation, which is is bizarre. It's like we're watching an episode of Veep. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, this is an area where if they want to be competitive with the conservatives, they just have to do better. Like they have to be able to tell a story here that results in people trusting them more with the economic, uh, uh, issue set than, than the conservatives. Or I, I don't, you know, or I don't see how you win. Hey, Corey, just to stick with you for a second on this subject. One thing I do hear about her, to be fair to her, is that she's really, really good on FedProv stuff. That she builds really strong relationships with the provincial governments and gets it quite works with them quite well and harmoniously. Is that something that you would have observed? Uh, I, I think it depends at what point in time uh, you're talking about. I think there are periods of time where that's been true. Um, I, I think a lot of that was taken over by Don LeBlanc, and and he really was playing the lead. Uh, if you're okay. you know, so. You know, yeah, I, I do think so. You know, for for instance, you know, it's uh, 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 Premier Ford isn't being shy about saying that uh, he gets along well with her. Mm. Uh, but you know, I think some of those kinds of things have been tested a little bit. You know, we've seen um, uh, you know differences of opinion within the federal government uh, around the EV manufacturing stuff, differences with provinces around you know Stellantis and, and other things. And, you know, she's in a position where I think she has to be defending the integrity of, you know, the, the fisc a little bit in ways that is pushing back against premiers more than, than you know, uh, uh, improving the relationship there. So I think that's evolved a little bit over the last year or so. But, you know, generally speaking, yeah, that would be more of an area of strength for her than, than, uh, than the comm side. Yeah. Jordan, why did you pick her as the least valuable liberal of the year? Ah, I did it reluctantly because uh, I I want to like her. She is a very competent woman. She is very smart, but I have to agree with one of Corey's points, and I think it outweighs. I was so excited when they recruited her. I know. You know? I just I know. thought, my God, what a star for them, especially and, and when I they know. recruited her to have pulled in, my you know. And I know from people who work with her, like she does, she brings a lot, right? Like, I, and I think that paradoxically. In this government, in the in this late stage fan de regime mode that they're in, she's also carrying the government, right? Like she is doing so much fucking work to keep that machine going Too forward. Too much. And it has pulled her into that internal world and it's reinforced, I think, some of her worst instincts in terms of communications and uh, a lack of focus on voters that puts them at the center of the story has really like it's cost her a lot and i think the biggest problem that she faces is that when she communicates about the government's economic story she does seem to be incapable of connecting with ordinary canadians she talks in a way that is disconnected she talks about things that don't reflect people's lived realities the instinct to always say, well, it's not that bad. Like, you know, your wages are growing. Sure, not as fast as inflation, but they're growing. You should be happy about that. Like, that shit has to stop. And I think that, regrettably, at this what point... Is a, what is one of the rules of communication, Jordan, right? Like, you do yes, not start your you answer... If you lead with explaining... You don't start... Well, you don't lead with something that everybody's going to disagree with. If the might, first thing out of your mouth is something that everybody yeah. disagrees with... You might be doing the wrong thing. And so... And I, and I can... And I know that she is... I know that she has received that advice and it obviously is not working. So 
that lead that leads me to the point that says that keeping her in this file as the primary communicator on economic issues is such a mistake. She can't do it effectively, but also the prime minister can't do it effectively. And so that means there is no one doing it effectively. And this is deepening their problems in a massive way. Do you think anybody has put her through media training? I like, think or, there, there were or, certainly or yeah. there must have been or early there on. must have been. I'm or not is she sure. Such a big, is she such a big star that she doesn't need it? Because like there are so many like kind of bizarro ticks yeah. going on. There. I don't like, actually like, think so. Sort of, I don't sort of, think that's you know, the case. Head head padding. You know, I'm going to explain everything to you, you dumb Canadians. Like all of that stuff yeah. is such such. Uh, I, I actually so don't think it's the case. Violations of like the ABCs of, of political communications. Yeah. I if think were, she does get the advice and the training because you can see at various moments, like you can, you can almost see the gears going in where she's trying to do the right connect thing. And then she, she slips off it in the next answer. So I think that like, there's an effort there, but it's clearly not, it's not uh, an instinct for her. And some people just really have a hard time with that. And they are wonky by nature and, and that means they're maybe just not your best communicators in those files. And I think that that's the case for her. Uh, and unfortunately, I doubt that's going to change. So the fact that the government has kept her in this league communications role for the most important file, big weakness. Scott, could you fix her? And by asking you that, I'm asking, can Andrew Bevan fix her? Uh, well, you can. Uh, I don't think you can get to great. Uh, but you can you can um, you can eliminate some of the bad. Uh, you should be able to eliminate the truly atrocious, uh, and you can get to consistent good. Uh, the like I mean, she's the epitome. I, I know I I don't want to I don't want to pile on uh, because I kind of come to the. Uh, there's no question that she's my vote as well, um, and I come to it with some reluctance. Certainly no glee. Um, because I do have a lot of respect for her. Um, and it doesn't sound like it on this pod very often. I know I sound like I'm always pounding on her. But it's because I come at it from such Because she's bad at a, politics. It's not, she's she not a bad person, and that, she's not an yeah. insubstantial, unaccomplished person. She's just bad at politics. But right here's now. the way I would answer your question about fixing her, quote-unquote fixing. Um, I think she's the epitome um, of like the inside outside rule which applies to certain like to ministers right we've all seen inside outside politicians so she's great inside right she knows how to manage cabinet government she knows how to move files along when to move them now now you may not always agree with her or whatever right but she's comfortable in that setting and therefore her colleagues are on the table this is why she had such a dazzling reputation initially because people were like holy shit i'm watching her at work and i'm watching her manage complex files move these things along on but so it's the inside outside thing and it's like watching someone and this is the answer to your question about fixing. It's like watching someone who isn't funny be asked to do stand up. Like it's really fucking hard. She's the minister of finance at a time when interest rates are going up, the economy is going south, people are feeling fear and anxiety about their economic circumstances, and they need someone that has the ability to connect and communicate with them. That notwithstanding all the difficulties that you're feeling, here's the sense of the plan that we have and we understand your needs and that we have a way forward that's going to actually benefit you, even if you don't feel it immediately. That's asking a lot. That's asking someone to grab the stand up, Mike, and be dead dog, Chris Rock, hilarious. And she's not funny. Like, in, she's not funny. And it's hard to teach funny. And I don't obviously mean literally funny. I mean that ability to connect the ability to be outside, not just inside, it's just not in her gearbox. So you can strip away some of the obvious mistakes and you can uh, get her to a place of being a strong, solid communicator. But on a file like this, at a time like this, when it's so vital, when greatness may not get you through the valley, um, it's just really, really hard. And I, I don't think it's like teaching someone to be funny. Um, you can... You can teach them a joke, but can you teach them rhythm, the music of language, the pace, the timing? It's hard. And, and how is it even possible when she's got her head so much in the day-to-day -day of running the government because she's carrying that, right? Well, the government has a part-time finance minister, and that's not acceptable in this circumstance. Yeah. Right? I think that's part of it. But uh, my perception is that she was doing a lot better when she was at Foreign Affairs. When, yes. you know, when, when it was the free trade agreement, renegotiations, dealing with the Trump administration, dealing with you know, uh, 
uh, the, the, that issue set, she seemed to be doing better. And I, I don't know the reason why, but, uh, but like on the economic stuff, it's, uh, maybe it's just the inability to, to express empathy for where people are at. I don't know, but it, it, uh, it has certainly fallen flatter. Okay. Hurley birdieites. It has become clear to me over the last several years that you adore data. I mean, sure, you love political gossip and juicy insights and revelations, but mostly you love data. And I'm a polling guy. I'm with you. Data is real. So as we head into that festive, feel-good last week before Christmas, as offices empty and lunches linger into mid-afternoon, and we all get a little goodwill before plunging headlong into the bleak entombment of deep winter, I have some fun seasonal data for you from our sponsor, CN. You've heard me say probably a thousand times by now that without the railroad, the economy stops. Well, you can sort of say the same thing about Christmas. Here's why. Last year, CN moved 1,741 carloads of games and toys. Let me put that in a bit of perspective. A long-haul freight train often pulls more than 100 cars and stretches 10 to 15,000 feet. So CN's toys and games load last year amounted to roughly 17 two-mile-long trains. But there's more, so much more. You think 1,741 carloads of games and toys was a lot? Get this, at the same time, CN moved 2,188 carloads of wrapping paper, 22 two-mile-long trains full of wrapping paper. Gotta have wrapping paper. Fun fact, it would take 1,500 square feet of wrapping paper to wrap a boxcar. There were 842 carloads of candy, chocolate, and other confectionery things last year. A few more things. Every year, CN moves between 150,000 and 175,000 Christmas trees. For those of you who don't want to forage out into the woods with a crosscut saw, one shipping container can fit about eight to 900 trees. You'd have to ship a snowman at minus one to minus five degrees in a refrigerated rail container. I have no data on French hens, calling birds, golden rings, or geese, sorry, but if they were shipped, it would almost certainly be by train. Anyway, you're up to date. Happy Mary. We'll see you next year, and for heaven's sake, when you hear the clanging bells at a crossing, stop. Okay, next category. Most valuable, most outstanding, most outstanding conservative. And the default answer, Corey is Pierre Polyev. I presume that is your answer as well. Uh, I'm going to give a you know an assist to Jenny Byrne. Uh, well, no kidding. Uh, <laughs> because you know, I, I think I think yes uh, to uh, to Polyev as, as the main answer. But I think you know the, the there are some very good strategic decisions that have been made, and we've talked about them already. So I won't I won't belabor going through them again. But I think the advertising campaign is is right on the money, and I think. Uh, there's a lot of strategy, and, and as well as they're doing on the fundraising side, you know, you only get to fire those bullets once, and you uh, you got to be really careful about uh, doing it right. And I think they've they've made some good decisions there. I also think they've been able to kind of keep a lid on some of the crazy in the caucus, which is always so impressive. A, which yeah. is all, always uh, a challenge for conservatives, and, and frankly, was being a big challenge for the, the preceding two leaders. Um, and, you know, I think, it, it, you know, it's a combination of, 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 of Polyev and I think his ability to communicate, which I think is quite impressive. It kind of, if you want to say the opposite of what we were just talking about with, with Freeland, he's been able to, to kind of have viral moment after viral moment over the course of the year. Not everything is a home run, but he's certainly had some home runs there and he's had some good third base hits there. So I, I think that natural ability combined with a strong team and we'll use use Jenny as the overall uh, proxy for, for, for team uh, within that leadership group. But, you know, certainly Ian Todd and others there that are, are very experienced hands. But, uh, you know, you bring it together and I think I think definitely the most valuable. Yeah, I mean, I don't know, Scott, where... Pierre ends and Jenny begins. It's such it's a very close team, obviously, and they're very much aligned in what they're doing. But it's a very impressive campaign that they've been running for the last year. Very disciplined internally, strategic externally. A couple things that we would have quibbled with here and there. And sometimes Polyev steps outside the suit a little bit. 
And I maintain that while he is absolutely the most outstanding conservative of the year, he remains the most important potential vulnerability of the conservatives as well. Well, uh, you've you've scooped me uh, and my desire to scoop the rest of us, which is that I'm going to pick him for both. I'm going to pick him for both the most um, valuable conservative. I also think that he could be their um, uh, their biggest weakness because in although they haven't been extraordinary and they haven't been consequential and that they didn't leave lo- didn't leave lasting bruises where there have been a couple of mistakes this year I think they've almost entirely uh, owed to to him and, and mistakes of judgment and and impulse on his part and I think that there's a big clue there and I've ran, I've railed about this in the past so but to stick with the positive for a second before I you know we'll come around to the other. Um, I would say that I think there's a real secret sauce with the Jenny Polyev combination because I think that they have complementary attributes. You know, she, the, both of them are united in a world view. Both of them are united in a diagnostique of what has been what has been failing in the last couple of campaigns nationally. Uh, in terms of the lack of discipline, the impulse to correct, and all of that. So all of those things, now they'll prove to be right or wrong on it. Right now, it looks very, very solid. So there's a whole pile of things like that, and where they want to occupy and how they want to build their voter coalition. And there's some innovation and, and, and frankly, some courage um, in how they want to build their voter coalition in terms of the things that they're willing to be deaf to and, and inconsiderate of. I think that's really interesting. But I think they're also complementary in the sense that, you know, Jenny built a machine that's really heavy on the individual person. So those folks connecting with those people through social media over the course of the past two, three, four years, building up that army, translating, vitally translating that army into people who show up at events and then turning them into votes for leadership and now turning them into votes and money and they've used that it's not just data it's also like it's just they're mining people and so she is that field marshal and she knows that and she knows the ground and she's dead disciplined and then he uh has a point of view about how to oppose a government how to how to how to how to run uh communications and broader you know positioning how to manage uh, a caucus Yep. And so I think I think you see those things. So the things they agree on a pile of important fundamental things and then their ability to execute and where their disciplines, um, small d disciplines uh, uh, specialize are very complementary. And the combination is pretty goddamn potent, especially when you're facing a government that's nine years in and looking a little tired during an economic crisis after a global pandemic crisis. And uh, just I don't know, just one fucking crisis after another. Jordan, what do you think about Polyev as the most outstanding conservative of the year? Yeah, hands down. I mean, I will never get over that this guy who, you know, was skippy on Parliament Hill, elected when he was 24, and now is is somehow leading the national Be honest, Jordan, we've made a career out of not taking this guy seriously. That's right. And, and I, and, and wow, like that, that's a, you know, and I think, I think in particular for the liberals who, and, and I know that there are many who cling to the notion that they cannot be beaten by this guy because he was a joke. He was a punchline for so many years, but you know, that that's about to come crashing to the ground, I think. And it is masterful to take someone like that, who is by his very career, the consummate Ottawa insider, and to take that and turn him into the leader of an army of outsiders running against the status quo in Ottawa. Like, wow, that's, you know, and I I do think a lot of credit goes to Jenny for that. And, and, you know, to um, the question of where, where he ends and she begins. I mean, I think we see some of those seams and maybe we'll get to that when we talk a little bit about least valuable conservative, because I, I think that he is absolutely, Absolutely, his ability to stay focused and to carry a message that connects with voters uh, has far surpassed what anybody would have predicted from him. If you think about him in his backbench days, you know, or his, even his democratic reform critic days, and mm. like he's really transcended the personality that he crafted for himself in the Harper years, and and that is that's a talent. 
Um, but but he also has he has some impulses that are less good. And I think it's really interesting to see how he and Jenny play off each other uh, in order to try some of those things and also to restrain them when they can be harmful. So maybe mm -hmm. that leads us into. Well, since we're giving Jenny such love, I mean, just one last shout out, you know, in the days before in the in the before days before Corey and Jordan Scott, um, we used to regularly have conversations with Jenny. And we would regularly give her the advice that the Conservatives needed to moderate positions on issues and needed to tack toward the centre in order to put together majority numbers. And she consistently disagreed with us on that, consistently said that there would be more votes in being principled Conservative position. And um, and so we're see and she's running that strategy. And so far, they're 15 points up. So yep, that's what that, I mean David by their, Scott. That's what I mean by a courageous... It's a, it's a courageous and innovative approach to building their voter coalition. It, it is not it is it is not preoccupied with okay. And then once we've animated our base, we need to get a pivot and look at the ones in the middle and get those other those loose fish. Um, it's not it, it's not based on that observation, and it will not be based on that observation. They will not do that. Right. Okay. Well, least it, least valuable concern. Sorry, you got something to say, Corey? Go ahead. I, I was just going to say, you know, I, I think it's more of a tack back towards a, 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 you know, a Harper conception of how you manage a political coalition. And I think there was a deviation from it for under two other leaders that that, you know, particularly under uh, O'Toole. But, you know, you need to have coherence within your team. And and um, and look, I think O'Toole's days were numbered from the moment he endorsed a carbon tax in the same way that I think. Patrick Brown's days were numbered from the, the moment he endorsed a carbon tax. It's like an unviable position in the modern Conservative Party. It was a funny carbon tax, though. Yeah. Oh, you yeah. could get a solar-powered blender. <laughs> this is a for Canadian tire box. <laughs> Consumers <laughs> distributing. I would like a blender and an alarm clock. Uh, <laughs> no, I would like to be less for gas. Uh, all right. Least, least valuable Conservative... Uh, our default position, as offered up here by Jordan, and I'll let her speak to why it is, is uh, a tie between Dean Allison, Colin Carey, and Leslin Lewis. Why? So I was pitching this as the, you know, this was the AFD incident where they met with Christine Anderson and they just, you know, uh, really, I think, broke an otherwise pretty solid year of party discipline for the Conservatives with like a little burst of far right kookiness. And I don't, I don't necessarily want to pick on them because it's more what they represent, right? It's that, it's that reflex, it's that instinct within the Conservative Party. And I think it's also some fumbles within the leadership about how that was managed. Like, why are these, why, you know, why was there pretty much no consequence for them, leaving the impression that that, that sort of thing is tolerated? And I think we can maybe extend this into there, there are some bad political reflexes that come from this corner of the camp. And sometimes those are being echoed by Polyev himself. And I'm going to lay one other example on the table. And I think that we saw a little, little dip into conspiracy land again in the last couple of weeks with the Ukraine stuff. And this is something where, you know, they're out trying to make a case about the carbon tax and voting against the free trade agreement with Ukraine. But I don't think anybody thinks they're talking about the carbon tax. I think most people who hear that are, are puzzled by it. Why would they be opposing a free trade agreement with Ukraine it, unless they want to send some sort of beep, 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 bat signal to some folks in their base uh, who have some affinity for Russia, and that stuff's weird. And so I think it's this weird, this reflex to kind of gravitate towards some of the more problematic elements, maybe in some of those voters that they're seeking to recapture from Bernier. They don't need them all, but they do need some of them. And this is very explicit when Jenny talks about her strategy, is recapturing some of those votes. There have been moments where they have strayed too far into that territory, and I think it can hurt the in the long run and we might be seeing a little bit of evidence of that over the last couple of weeks all right i hear you scott who's your least valuable conservative well, mine's an apprehended choice um i mean the, the, uh, take jordan's default choice they only matter um in relation to how the leader handles them so they haven't that the, 
we might get all wound up with AFD, but it didn't penetrate in a public fashion in the way that these things sometimes do. Sometimes they take fire, like, you know, and it wasn't Bevoda's orange juice. It didn't become that kind of moment where he had to pronounce one way or another. He was asked about it. He kind of blew it off, all that kind of stuff. So, you know, eventually he'll get challenged in a more f- fundamental way. But my apprehended choice is Pierre Polyev for... um not just because of those and, you know, those reasons that, you know, well, maybe sometimes he's too indulgent of that stuff. And there's a little bit of, you know, well, we're not going to back away from the convoy types. And, uh, you know, because we choose to interpret the convoy types as, you know, saying, like, get out of our way and don't, uh, you know, don't tell us what to do. And we're going to be for that. And, but at the same voice, you know, we'll dismiss criminal behavior or outright hate speech and all that kind of stuff. And, and I think he's been successful in walking that line. And straddling that, and I think he, I wouldn't be surprised if he continues to, especially in the absence of a paid media campaign from the liberals that makes him pay for it. I think the weakness, and I've said this before, and I know people think I'm indulging in a conspiracy theory. There is something I detect in the way that Polyev communicates that he's not, he is unsatisfied with simply piling up potential votes. He wants to persuade people that he has a unified field theory. That is the Jordan Petersonism of his of the politics. It's that the communication is give them wings and they will fly. I have this sort of, you know, thing and I think that that combined with the impulse of the ladies not for turning, which is what drives the 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 observations that Jenny and he have brought to the last 5 years of conservatives. I, I think that he could walk himself into a heavy duty punch at some point. So uh, right now he's indisputably the most valuable conservative. He's likely to remain that. He's likely to win the next election. I'm not a fool. I recognize all those things. If it comes to shit, I think it will come to shit because there will be a self-indulgence on some of this stuff that will take him into weird territory and that it will be about his own hubris, his own sense of self, the sense that he wants to create for himself not just as a great orator, but as someone who has deep, profound observations about society and politics and all that lays beneath. And I think that could get him into fucked up territory. And I think he might be unwilling to cede that fucked up territory. And uh, and something in there could be really used to hammer him at some point. Hmm. Corey, you got a thought as to who the least valuable conservative is? Well, I'm going to go to the provinces for this one. I think it's Kevin Falcone and uh, BC United. Like, I think they're, I think they're on the verge of not being a relevant party in in the province anymore. And you know, as as for the others, you know, like uh, Dean Allison and Colin Carey and the gang. Like, I, I I can't give them that much credit. I just think it's they're just two minor players, and it's just too insignificant a moment to, to really be elevated to that. Uh, but yeah, if we're looking at... The score on it is beautiful, Corey. I love it. <laughs> but like, but like I, you know, what, what do I think is interesting that's going on in the conservatives around some of these, like some of these issues? It's actually the sunset of social conservatism in, in the party under, under uh, Polyev. Like what is so noticeable is the influx of millennials and the influx of elements of that sort of convoy group, which are far more libertarian. And, you know, if you look at all the policy resolutions and all these things that are not terribly meaningful in the larger grand scheme of things that, you know, but at the uh, convention in Quebec City, all of that crazy SoCon shit got voted down, like overwhelmingly. And they move towards, you know, endorsements of, of body and autonomy, which, you know, sounds like, you know, softcore drug legalization and uh, the morning after pill. It, it means they're ardently pro-choice, right, Craig? Uh, yeah. yeah, well, like, yeah, like, ar- like ar- ar- ardently, uh, I think, you know, it, under, uh, under Polyev, yes, but I also think like that is a, that is a big significant change. For a long time, about 20% of the party were pretty as uh, hardcore as SoCons. That percentage is probably half that now. It hurt uh, Sheer. It hurt Sheer in 2019. That's yeah, for sure. Well, but Sheer is a social conservative, and you know, a bit loopy on some of those issues. And and outside the mainstream, it's not at all where where Polyev is, and and has been. But there has been a change in the party as a result of the influx of of those other people. It's a much more libertarian tinge to it. And so, you know, I th- I think that's a change. It's a meaningful change. It's going to affect the party for years to come. All right, Corey, let's stick with you. Most valuable, new de- most outstanding new Democrat. Why do I keep saying valuable? Most outstanding new Democrat, and the default answer is Wab Canoe. Uh, clearly, uh, 
huge victory. And, uh, and I think, um, not an easy victory in some ways. Like, you know, the race ended up being closer than, than it was anticipated to be. Uh, they had to, to hold a very tough line and, and uh, you know, the opposite of situation what we're talking about federally, the, uh, uh, the conservatives in, in Manitoba left no ammunition unfired on the table. Like they took risks. They shot, you know, every bullet and artillery round they could get their hands on. Uh, they suffered through sort of the criticism of people and say, you know, and, and taking that approach, but you gotta, you gotta, well, they knew it. they had to swing. They, they had to, and, and they tightened the race considerably, but you know, on the other, on the receiving end of that, uh, uh, was the NDP and they had to have a very disciplined campaign and they had to do some pretty tricky comms there. I, and, you know, I think, uh, think they did a, did a masterful job and, and got the win. So, um, yeah, for sure. So Jordan, I mean, why why is there always this discrepancy between the federal New Democrats and these provincial New Democrats who are competitive and or win? Like Wab Canoe, you know, he promised to cut the gas tax mm-hmm. in yeah. order to win that election. Mm-hmm. I just can't imagine anything like that coming out of Jagmeet Singh's mouth. Well, I think I think that this is I mean, of course, this is a really long tradition that that Prairie New Democrats have have always been more more centrist than their federal counterparts. And I think in part it's it's the um, you know, in the prairies, they they have one government that has led to a much more pragmatic streak in the party. And of course, the liberals are a non-factor. So there's not the same there's not that same competition for the left vote that you see federally. So that that constructs really a very different political debate. And I do think that culturally within, within the Prairie uh, NDP sections, there's always been much more, not even just tolerance and support, but demand for pragmatism in these polities. They, they are populist, unabashedly left-wing economic populist. And so that does lead you to say things like, yes, we need to fight climate change, but we are aware that there's many tools on the table and we're not going to sacrifice a potential political win at the altar defending a particular tool that is unfavorable politically. And I think that Canoe pulled that off very well. And I, you know, I I agree absolutely that he would be the NDP MVP of the year. And I think, and I think it's, it's because uh, of what Corey said in terms of the discipline campaign, but also it's about how they put forward the NDP vision in that campaign because they managed to do something that is very rarely done, which is they connected the party's value. So, for example, on healthcare, on better services for healthcare, they did it in a way that was concrete. They communicated clearly and in a disciplined way about reopening three ERs, like real things for real people in a real place. It was not abstract. It was tangible for people. They understood it and it worked. And then they, the other thing that they did that I think was so important is that they managed to have that fight on a terrain that was more favorable for them on the healthcare issue with a real tangible offer without ceding the affordability ground to the conservatives. They had an affordability offer. They did make a bold choice in terms of making that give on the gas tax uh, that you know could have left them open. And, and I think that in addition to the fact that they didn't take the bait on some of the most really egregiously racist and awful crap that came out of the Stephenson campaign, it was the fact that they were able to provide those offers in real ways to their voters that I think made it uh, such a compelling win. And of course, I think Wob's personal story matters a lot. It matters a great deal that there is now an Indigenous Premier in Manitoba. That is huge. And uh, so I think he's got a lot to be proud of this year. Scott, in the interest of moving it along, let's move to the least valuable New Democrat. And our default choice here is Sarah Jama, the MPP from uh, Queen's Park in Ottawa. Is that your choice or do you have a different choice? Not really my choice. I mean, she certainly was uh, the most spectacular uh, and notorious, if you will. Uh, She'll have a lot of people that are in support of where she was at, but um, she's notorious because she made life uh, brutal and uncomfortable for her own party and her own leader. And I think that she demonstrated that, um, like, if you want to, if you want to be involved in a party, then you have to understand it's a team. And if you're involved in a team, then sometimes you have to surrender yourself 
to the implicit and explicit rules of team, which is that I, I don't, I don't always like, I can't just reject something important that comes from my leader and expect to then maintain all the privileges of being within that party. And so, so that's that, but my, my choice is um, more obvious and direct and it's Jagmeet Singh. I just don't yeah, think that's he's good. the right choice. Yeah. I just don't think he's good. And I think, you know, you've got a historically uh, embattled government right now, liberal party. Um, I think you can make all kinds of arguments. And I hear Jordan and Brian Top and people make these arguments about getting things done and the dental. And I agree that the dental stuff is substantive and is going to have a lasting effect for many, many millions of people. But as a matter of a political enterprise, I don't think the guy's gaining votes. I don't think that he's making inroads at the expense of his opponents. I think that he may be losing votes to conservatives as well. I think he's still likely set up for a squeeze play by the liberals at some point down the road. And... Um, and I don't think that people have come to know him better, have come to like him better. I know that the, the big thing people say, well, you know, folks really like him. I don't see a lot of evidence of that. I know that when I encounter him, he seems likable, but I, I don't think that people know him, understand him, crave him. Uh, and so I just don't think he's getting it done. I don't think he's going to get it done. And uh, uh, so I think that's a pretty big failing. Yeah, I mean, like, this is an enormous window for the NDP with the government in, with the liberals in this much trouble, right? You could imagine a situation in which the NDP leapfrogged the liberals in the next election is a fight between the NDP and the conservatives. But I don't think, I don't see Singh doing that. And I think he is a nice guy and I think he's a well motivated guy, but I just don't think he connects on a political policy level where people think of him as a prime minister, as somebody that can do that. So I I don't have any issues with the guy. I just don't think he works. And I think there's lots of evidence now that says he doesn't uh, doesn't work, Jordan. I'm going to let Corey go because I think he's got something to say. No? Uh, you got nothing to say? Well, just look, hard I, agreement? I, I, look, I, I, look, it's, it, it's saying, like, I don't think he works. I think he's, you know, if we were to say what's the most true thing about polling over the last... Uh, two years. It's at the, at the NDP are at 18 points. Like he has just not moved the. He's not moved the needle. It'll move for maybe a couple of weeks and then it moves back. Like he is still bleeding to the Conservatives in you know places like Northern Ontario and Southwestern Ontario through their union base. Like and you know he's the only guy who likes Rolexes and five thousand dollar suits more than I do. And and he's in the wrong party for that. He's in the wrong party. Like I just think he is. Um, uh, someone who who has reached the maximum political potential they have and is not growing and is not going to grow. And I think if the NDP were smart, they'd get rid of him after the next election. Well, unsurprisingly, I'm going to disagree. I think that there are things that he needs to be doing differently and better. And I'm, I've got to hate you for that. But I want to talk about why I don't think I don't think he would at all be in the category of least valuable. I think he is actually bringing quite a bit of value to the federal party, which we can't forget is in fourth fucking place and is now delivering and driving the government agenda to a previously unthinkable degree. They have managed to squeeze out of the liberals, not just one at this point, now two, I would say three major concessions. You've got anti-scab, you've got dental, and you have upcoming, it looks likely to get some form of tangible pharmacare. These are big, expensive items that doesn't cost the NDP a single cent to get put into place, but appeals greatly to their vote base. So they have managed to twist the liberals into providing things that are going to be appealing to NDP voters. And by the way, you also have them now outside of Quebec within striking distance of the Liberals. Now, do they need to do more to capitalize on that? Absolutely. But I think it would be completely wrong to say that he hasn't managed to turn a very weak position in Parliament to one of historic influence and strength. And I do believe that if they make some changes in how they talk about that with voters, <coughs> I think there could be rewards for them in the next campaign. When he was chosen, Jordan, what was the understanding inside the party about the Quebec base? Like, what was, because the NDP are at 5% now. So that whole orange wave thing is over, 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 over. And 
it's happened under his watch. And was that expected and therefore okay? Or do people go, Jesus, man, we used to have 50 MPs there. I think that within the NDP membership, there was a sense that after Mulcair's leadership, where he was chosen expressly to hold the NDP position in Quebec and was also unable to do so, that that, that was too tall of an order to make the top demand for any NDP leader. And when Singh was chosen, it was really clear that what united party members around him was the sense of energy, the ability to reach out to new voters, particularly in the 905. A lot of his personal appeal was what galvanized people around him. And I don't, I, I don't think that the question about Quebec was top of people's minds simply because They'd had their ass handed to them so recently on that file with a leader who was really uh, speaking directly to Quebecers. Now, does that leave the party in a bit of a pickle now? Yes, absolutely. There is no potential path to victory for the NDP ever without passing through Quebec. And I think it's very fair to say that that is an order that Singh is not going to meet, um, certainly not in this next campaign. But I don't think it was, nor do I think it was expected that he would do so. In, when he was elected leader. Excellent. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead, Scott. Corey. Yeah. Well, well I was just going to say, so, you know, then the NDP have a leader that has no potential to ever win. And I just don't think that's, uh, you know, that, that, that is putting a cap on, on your growth that I don't think any political party in its right mind should ever do. You know, you've got to, you've got to be trying to contest to win. Uh, if or or you're in the wrong business, and, uh, and but Corey, don't uh, compare him to the Almighty. Compare him to the alternatives. <laughs> I will. But, yeah. uh, but you know, I, as I would say, you, if there's a leader that you know can't win, you got to get rid of that leader. And and you know, personal feelings don't really get into it, right? Like, um, you know, uh, I, I, as an individual, I think Andrew Shears, perfectly nice guy. I don't think he could ever win as as the leader, and therefore had to go. But um, but it's not personal. It's uh, it's a assessment of the politics of the thing. Not sure. All right, Corey, let's stick with you because provincial premier of the year and our default answer is Premier Ford, who has weathered a number of controversies, um, is now into his, I guess, uh, sixth year of uh, being premier and is 15, 20 points up in the polls in the 40s and looking like uh, he's a good bet for re-election. So he's our provincial premier of the year. Well, I'm not going to argue with that one. But uh, but look, I, I think it, it speaks to the resiliency of, of Ford. And um, you know, he, you know, I think hasn't always gotten things right. And we could you know, and have talked about where some of those missteps have been in the past. But he is the master of the course correction, and uh, and being able to to you know back up two steps and then uh, and then move forward and actually bring people back with him and into his coalition. I think the challenges are going to be to to maintain that level. You know, government is is tough. Like you're always going to have challenges and things that you have to work through. And I think there's a more competitive uh, political environment uh, in Ontario. You know, the NDP are being sort of stumbling out of the blocks with their new leader, but um, but it's always a, you know it's always a competitive political environment in Ontario. Always, so you know I think um, you know it's going to be a challenge o over the next two years to you know keep maintaining that focus, and I think make some smart political decisions. I think one of them is doing a major advertising campaign on it to define Bonnie Crombie and the Liberals. And do that early, um, and for all the reasons that I think it was a mistake for the Liberals federally not to do that on Polyev. Um, it's smart to do it on Crombie. So um, anyway, I, I he also has the benefit of being a pretty nice guy. And there, uh, there you go. There you go. Well, that's a warm intro, Scott. Is he your Premier of the Year? No, mine's Lego because I think that he has. Uh, if twenty twenty three is like the whole year, then he spent a lot of the year being the Colossus that he was until he wasn't the Colossus that he was. And now the fact that he's no longer, uh, you know, standing over top of Quebec politics, able to do whatever he wishes without consequence, that plunges us into a completely new world, one that we don't understand, one that might redefine Quebec politics yet again, because for a while he busted the fault line between Federalist and, and Separatist, 
Uh, now it's something else. Now the pay keys might come back. I don't know how real that is. I just think that might be a, an expression of disaffection. Um, uh, I just don't know where it goes, um, but it has massive consequences in the province and it has massive consequences federally. So I think he's the most important provincial premier. Uh, and I think in many ways, his troubles are the most important provincial development uh, for the coming years to keep our eye on. Right. But I mean, the fact that the after all that he's done with his nativist government, that the PQ are the people who pass him is a pretty strong indication that nationalism in Quebec is as alive and well as ever. Yes. Right. Jordan, thoughts on Premier of the Year? Well, um, I mean, I like Evie, but I'm going to, I am also going to go with Ford, but it's going to be like a backhanded insult, unsurprisingly. So um, <laughs> I'm handing, I'm saying yes, Ford, uh, you know, maybe in the same spirit as, as Scott picked to let go is a bit of the, the big story of the year, but he also gets a big fucking bag of coal because yes, he's great at apologizing, but that's also because he had to walk back almost every single major initiative he had this year from Greenbelt to MZOs to the Peel region stuff. So he, yes, he is somehow miraculously covered in Teflon and, and I'm sure Corey's there like respraying that Teflon coating every damn day. But, uh, but also he is responsible for his own problems uh, which is its own special kind of challenge when you're a premier whose government is so bonded to him personally as Ford is. So I think, yes, like probably premier of the year for what he's been able to navigate, but he like he's navigating himself. So uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a bit of a mixed bag for Ford. So even even with the carbon tax and 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 the, the cost to the podcast, I'm going to buy him the bag of coal. All right. Okay, best strategy of the year. And our default one, chosen by me, is going to be the incredible discipline and relentlessness with which Polyev connected the carbon tax to affordability and therefore, as we speak, has convinced most Canadians that the government is part of the affordability problem. Um, and through its carbon tax. And many people mocked him when he first became leader for the rhetorical devices that he was using and the stretches that he makes, but he has been relentless and he has been successful. And as, we, and as we're doing this show, people think the carbon tax is an affordability problem, and he's done that. Well, with some very important help from the Trudeau Liberal government, the absolute reversal around home heating fuel in Atlantic Canada basically accepted every premise around that that Polyev had been putting out there and and said, yeah, no, it's legit. We got to do this. So, I, uh, you know, I, I, I agree. And and he gets the credit for for doing that. But I think that the, the success on it, it is is owed in part uh, to the Liberal Party itself. For accepting that, right? Interesting, Scott. What do you think? Uh, I think that what you say is correct, but I I don't think that was a hard decision to make, and I don't know that it was even a difficult thing to pull off because of the positioning that the Liberals left themselves in and the obvious uh, unpopularity of a carbon tax in the current economic environment, maybe even any economic environment. So I think I would uh, I would shift it slightly. I, I would say that the magic trick that we witnessed as a matter of best political strategy was the advertising campaign, which took a politician who spent 20 years defining himself as a rabid partisan who uh, who was always the sharp end of the spear, um, was used that way by Harper, followed the same policy and approach himself in terms of his own electoral politics and can leadership campaign, and, a, and, a, and an advertising campaign that recognized the need to broaden his image present him as a family man, um, make him admirable and likable and relatable, um, wisely stretch him out in terms of a unique background without going into detail, but just hints that, you know what, this guy is not actually maybe is what you expect in terms of his terms of his upraising. Um, I just think all of that was uh, so well executed, so strategic, um, 
And I think that almost all the things that have happened to the conservatives in the last six months that haven't been really, really good have been because they've lost sight of that fundamental and important thread. And I just think that it's it's the kite that they should hang on to and and fly to a large majority government. And I think uh, I think it was really impressive. He should watch those ads several times a day to remind himself to be that person. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because he clearly doesn't. It's, it's not what brings him joy. It's not. It's not what like gets him up in the morning. He is there for the pettiness, which you know we all have motivation, so that's not a crime. Okay, I'm gonna play ball on on uh, on a Polyev strategy as the best one of the year. But I actually think it's around tying housing and the housing affordability crisis so clearly to the Conservative Party. And I think it's about planting the seeds of it being an issue related to immigration. And I know I was like sending everybody the new Coletto numbers out about this last night because they gave me a fucking heart attack. Mm. Since April, you've got people across Canada up 14 points thinking that immigration numbers are too high. And I think that this is something we're going to see unfold in the next year. And I think it's uniquely dangerous for the liberals because unlike the carbon tax... Jordan, I mean, but it's like experts are saying it now, right? Yeah. Like I had Mike Moffat and Ron Butler on the podcast talking about housing, and they said, you have to look at demand. You Mm -hmm. have to look at demand, right? Totally. And I I think what's, what's so dangerous about it is that Unlike the carbon tax issue, where if the liberals were to apply some fresh political thinking to it, there is a way that they can kind of extract themselves from that political mess. This is much harder. This is very dangerous. This is juggling with live ammunition. And they have shown no ability to do that. So I actually think that uh, the marrying of the housing issue and the and the and the topic of immigration is potent. It's dangerous. And it's something that I think um, we are going to see play out in over the next year uh, in a way that, uh, and it pains me to say it, is probably going to be very, very lucrative for the Conservatives. And so that, for me, is actually the, the long play that I think could be more dangerous. All right. Well, okay, let's bring this to some kind or some. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, look, I, can, there's no path to victory without substantial support for conservatives amongst new Canadians. And like, if there's any notion that they're going to somehow become a Lego style nativist party, I think you're, 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 I can put your fears at ease. Like, no, 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 that's not what I, no, no. I just think, I just think that they, they are going to bond themselves even more closely to the housing issue. And they're going to come to define the terms of that issue in a way that other parties can't effectively even break into. Yeah. Well, where, where I think it's going to go on that is probably around foreign students. And, and maybe be, temporary foreign workers. Yeah. Those are the yeah, which, two places where people would think be it would be reasonable to cut back on that. That's right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I, you know, in, in some cases on te- temporary foreign workers, but for a, a lot of jobs where you actually see them and, you know, whether it's in greenhouses or things like that, it, they're there because the Canadians won't take those jobs. But, uh, you know, but if it's about building an a EV battery plant in the Windsor area, I think people have a different conclusion around that. And I think they've been trying to walk that line a little bit in a way that's smart. But on the, on, on the, uh, on the foreign student stuff, you know, the absolute vertical nature of those numbers uh, and, and what they're coming in to study seems more like a, a case of, of fraud being perpetrated against the students who are being brought over here uh, in a way that is, uh, you know, I think pretty, pretty dark and pretty, uh, uh, pretty problematic. So anyway. All right. Let's wrap this up with our hey use. Let's bring it to a conclusion. Mr. Pinsent, where are you? Ladies and gentlemen, please return to your seats. The hey yous are about to begin. Excellent. Okay, Scott, what do you got? Well, I start with this. I'm going to have an annual Hey You. I think about what was, uh, what's important about 2024. Um, and I think one of the things that's important about 2024 is that we not make it more likely that democracy is broken across a madman's knee. And, um, you know, that might sound hyperbolic, but I'm increasingly worried that it is not. And so my Hey You is to Joe Biden. Leave. Leave office. 
Okay, give somebody who's in their 50s a chance to compete, to uh, separate themselves from the economic record and uh, and from the question of age, which is an inescapable anvil. It just is. And uh, because there's only one thing um, that matters, I think, in the next year politically, and that is that Donald Trump not be permitted a second term. And if he does, he's going to split the world in half. Uh, and so, Joe Biden, you're now a barrier to that. You're not in a remedy to that. And you got to go, man. You're here. 100% agree. Corey, hey, you. To Jagmeet Singh, I think uh, he should be spending the Christmas holidays uh, doing a, a little walk in the snow himself, not to not to leave and resign. I don't think that's the right answer, but to, to leave uh, this uh confidence and supply agreement. I think he would be much better served uh, to be extracting things from the government on a on a on a one off basis and having a little more drama about, you know, what constitutes uh, appropriate policy measures for them to do in order to maintain his support, make himself look less like the defender of a government that is increasingly unpopular and more like somebody who is an opposition leader holding them to account and trying to extract things from them. I think, you know, if we're trying to Make things better for for jug meat. I know it's pretty pretty down on him earlier. Um, I think that would be that would be one way to do it. And um, so my hey you is uh, hey jug meat. Uh, time to leave the agreement and and do something to that's more beneficial to yourself. Well, my hey you is also going out to jug meat, and uh, and I think we'll build on Corey's. So and actually, and he's got a new baby. So that's a really good. Uh, that's a here, really here. good way to go for walks in the snow is with a, yeah. you know, a cute little baby on you. Um, so I think that there is a need for the party. You keep up the wins, you know, the, those, those gains are real. Uh, do not listen to some of the whinging here, squeeze them for all they're worth, but you must have an exit strategy from the confidence and supply agreement. You have to chart that you have to make it count. You have to make it part of a coherent story and a, a caution around pharmacare. It is important to get something tangible out of that from the liberals, but don't make the mistake that people having something in their hands prior to the next election means that it won't become a victim or that people won't be just fine to let it go. Ask the liberals about that in Ontario. There was pharmacare in Ontario and the Ford government got rid of it and no one said anything. So you have to build a real case around affordability. You have to keep that issue square in your sights. Uh, pharmacare is great, but you have everything has to be a servant of a message that is going to sell Jigmeet, that is going to sell the story about what the party is doing at a values level and at a practical level to Canadians. And so my wish for Jigmeet over Christmas is to find some new energy and some new focus to get out there and sprint. And you need to sprint through the next year with a story and the discipline to stick to it. Excellent. All right. My Hey You is a little different. My Hey You is a, a helping of hurly humility. I just want to say to all the people that are involved in politics out there for all the parties, I sit here I laugh at what you've done. I make fun of what you've done. I criticize what you've done. Your jobs are way harder than mine. What you're trying to do is very, very difficult. Uh, I often do not know what all the constraints are on your decision making and why you have to make the decisions that you do. Um, you're almost certainly not as inept as sometimes any of you look. And I've made more than my fair share of mistakes in politics. So take everything that comes out of this pod with a grain of salt. We're just those old guys on the Muppets just carping about the shit that we're watching uh, go down. And uh, all of you, you're doing God's work no matter what party you're in, working in politics. And have a great holiday and have a great Christmas and all that. And with that, okay. I, would, I would like to thank our benevolent presenting sponsor, TELUS and CN Rail, for their ongoing support of this podcast. All of you who watch or listen throughout the year and feedback and say shit to us when you run into us or write stuff on the social media machine, thanks so much. It's so much fun to do this, and we have all of us a lot of fun doing it and interacting with you. So thanks for another year of listening, and we will see you on January the 8th. In the meantime, take care of yourselves. Have a good holiday.